Well, good afternoon, folks. This is session 4B, Physical Sciences, the Future of Faith and Philosophy of Science. Uh, my name is Arnold Sikkim. I'm the moderator for this afternoon's uh, session. I'm a physics professor at Trinity Western University, and all the speakers are physics professors, one of them also from Trinity Western University. And I'm also the executive director of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, which is the American, the Canadian expression of the American Scientific Affiliation. So we have three speakers, uh, Gary Burdick and Truett Weens and uh, Bob Wood. And our first speaker is uh, Gary Burdick, who's uh, from Andrews University, where he's not only a physics professor, but also the dean of research. And he'll be speaking under the title, The Philosophical and Theological Foundations of Modern Empirical Science. Okay, well, the theme of this conference is moving forward together. Uh, so you may wonder why I have a historical presentation here. But I think we need to know where we've come from to know how to move forward. So my presentation is based upon uh, Alvin Plantinga's uh, statement. Uh, there's a superficial conflict, but a deep concord between science and religion. When people talk about science and religion, particularly you have the uh, warfare mentality, uh, everything comes up as conflict. Uh, but Plantica, I think, is right to say that, yes, there's that conflict, but there's a deep underlying accord. And so I want to really delve into what that deep underlying accord is, particularly between Christian uh, theology and modern empirical science. So when you think about the foundations of modern empirical science, you think about the axioms. What is it that you must hold in common in order to do empirical science? And so the, uh, there you go. The first assumption is the universe exists. Now we can't prove that. Uh, we may live in the matrix. Uh, we may live in a hologram. Uh, there's other possibilities, but in order to do science, we have to actually as assume that the universe exists. And of course, this is something we kind of take for granted, but the philosophers of science don't take it for granted. All the way back to Leibniz, why is there something rather than nothing? Or more recently, Stephen Hawking, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Why does the universe go to all the bother of existing? It'd be much easier for it just not to exist in the first place. Uh, the second assumption is that the existence of the universe is important. It, it matters. It makes a difference. Uh, and you think about it, if, if it didn't make a difference, then there'd be no reason to study it. So there's something about the universe that's important that we should study, uh, and particularly this is important for physicists, studying the foundational uh, equations of the universe. Uh, so Steven Weinberg and Friedman Dyson are two uh, physicists who had this dialogue going back and forth. In his book, The First Three Minutes, Steven Weinberg wrote, it's almost irresistible for humans to believe that we have some special relation to the universe. He continued on, of course, in saying that um, the more we understand of the, of the universe, actually, the more purposeless it all is. Whereupon Freeman Dyson responded and say, no, the more we examine the universe and the details of its architecture, the more it seems that the universe must have known that we were coming. Now, if you've d looked at any of the fine-tuning arguments for the universe, the universe its initial conditions were set up such that creatures like us could exist. Um, even things like stars manufacturing uh, carbon. In order for the laws of physics to be such that stars can make carbon so that carbon-based life forms like us can exist, the universe has to be incredibly fine-tuned. The third assumption is that the universe is orderly. Yes is orderly and follows mathematical laws. Uh, Eugene Wigner uh, in 1960 wrote this uh, paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And his statement was, the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. <laughs> and throughout history, Physicists have come up with beautiful equations. Think of the Dirac equation. Think of, of many other equations. They come up with beautiful equations, and only later, because there were such beautiful equations, 10, 20 years later, it was shown those equations actually 
uh, bear resemblance to reality. Uh, Wigner continues by saying, we should be grateful for it and hope that it will re remain valid in future research, and it will extend, for better or for worse, to our pleasure, though perhaps to our bafflement, to a wide range of learning. So those are three fundamental assumptions. Uh, we can't do uh, science without these assumptions. And probably the fourth one is equally important, which is that we are capable of understanding the universe. What's very interesting in the elegant universe that Brian Greene uh, produced, there's a scene where he is trying to teach general relativity to his dog. And his dog just is not getting it. And he, and he says that, that, kind of, that uh, there's no way that his dog can understand uh, general relativity. Their brains just aren't wired to grasp it. And then he says, but what about us? How is it that we have the audacity to think that we can understand these fundamental laws? Uh, and this is actually comes to the second part of Plantinga's statement, the one that I did not quote, which is that there's a superficial concord, but a deep underlying conflict between science and naturalism. You can think that atheistic science and naturalism, they all go hand in hand and they, they all go really fine. But the thing that uh, Plantica points out, uh, it's controversial, not everybody agrees with it obviously, but the point that he brings out is that if our brains just evolved through naturalistic processes, then our brains should be well wired to know that when we, when we hear lion roar, we should run the other direction. But it doesn't give us any reason to believe that when we talk about the fundamental makeup of the universe, things that are not important for our survival, uh, that we should be able to understand that. That our brains should evolve through naturalistic processes to the point where it can tell us uh, truths about the universe is, in, in essence, a non sequitur. And so that is uh, Plantica's uh, conclusion. So we have these four assumptions. And these four assumptions, science can't answer why we have to have these assumptions. The best that science can do is say, well, these assumptions have worked for us in the past, so let's continue to hold these assumptions. But if you think about where these assumptions came from, uh, the first thing you'll see is that the doctrine of creation answers why, where these assumptions come from. So why does the universe exist? Why is the universe's existence important? Why does it follow mathematical laws? Because God created it. Uh, why is it that we're capable of understanding these laws? Well, because humans are created in God's image. And being created in God's image partially means that we were created to be co-creators with God, and so therefore that gives us the reason why we should be able to understand this. So the doctrine of creation is really roots, it provides the foundation for all of modern empirical science. Now, that is not merely a happenstance. If you look at the people who founded modern empirical science, there's lots of science in China and India and, and elsewhere, but our modern empirical science that we have now is rooted in Western Europe primarily Western European Protestantism, although Western European Catholicism as well, uh, where the founders of the modern science were all deeply religious individuals. So this just gives you a, a, a brief thing. Uh, Francis Bacon, depth in philosophy, which was a natural science, brings men's minds about to religion. Boyle, the rational contemplation of nature is philosophical worship of God. Uh, Descartes, the laws of nature are immutable and unchangeable because God himself is immutable and unchangeable. Um, this brings to mind C.S. Lewis's statement that uh, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a, law, in a lawgiver. And so when we look at the real foundations now, we still hold these foundations. Now, it doesn't mean that most scientists will uh, accept the doctrine of creation, but the assumptions that they make 
still are rooted in the doctrine of creation. Uh, Newton, my favorite scientist, um, was quite clearly uh, religious. To inquire after those laws on which the great creator actually chose to found this most beautiful frame of the world, not those by which he might have done had he so pleased. Newton was a voluntarist. If you think about the ancient Greeks, the Greeks thought that God had one way of creating the universe because there's only one best perfect universe, and so therefore you just have to think about it. Newton said no. God had a choice in how to create the universe, and so it was our responsibility to look at the universe, to examine it, to figure out which of the many choices God uh, actually made to create our universe. And that is really the root of empirical science, to say, no, we cannot just sit and think about what a perfect universe should be and say that's the way the universe is. You have to go out and, exactly, and actually examine the universe because God had a choice in how to create it. So all these scientific methods, including what we now call methodological naturalism, were actually established by scientists who were Christians, not by atheists. Now, Richard Dawkins has been quoted as saying that a methodological naturalist is simply a philosophical naturalist without the courage of his convictions. But that is really ignoring the history of where this came from. Now, we can all argue about whether methodological naturalism is the correct scientific method to use nowadays. Um, certainly, Stephen Meyer and others, uh, others who are actually here will, will make that argument. But that's not the point I'm trying to make here. The point I'm trying to make is that the richness and ability of our natural science, our empirical science, uh, to tell us something about the universe is actually coming from our, the doctrine of creation. Now, I must add a fifth assumption uh, on those four. And the fifth is that scientific results must be repeatable. When we talk about empirical science, you always have to have repeatable. You publish it and somebody else uh, hopefully will check and, and come to the same conclusions that you do. Uh, and this was known uh, for a long time. So this is a quote from Robert Hooke. Uh, stating that the, these dangers, uh, which are, all of these dangers are remedied by the real, the mechanical, the experimental philosophy. So the scientific method is a way to overcome the danger of uh, human error. Or uh, Richard Feynman's Cargo Cult Science, I really appreciate this, this lecture of Richard Feynman. Uh, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And it turns out that you can fool yourself easier than you can fool anybody else. And so he recognizes that and says that that is one error that scientists are prone to do, is to uh, think they have something and fool themselves, and then they try to fool everybody else because they themselves are fooled. But the whole scientific method is meant <coughs> to counteract that. But again, this comes from the doctrine of the fall. We are both finite and fallen creatures, so therefore our knowledge and understanding is imperfect, and so therefore it needs that corrective, which the modern empirical science provides. So I really like this quote from uh, my colleagues at Calvin University, uh, David Young and Ralph Sterley. Because scripture and the creative universe are both God-given, they cannot be in conflict. It is only the human interpretations of the God-given data that lead to discrepancy, <clears throat> conflict, and disagreement. And so, at this point in time, I hope I've convinced you that uh, there's no conflict between science and theology, and we can all uh, go home. Well. Particularly in my faith tradition, and I'm sure in many of yours, the conflict is real. And so we ask the question, what about conflict? When you think about conflict between science and theology, if we just look at theology itself, obviously there's no conflict within Christian theology. Uh, is Jesus human or Jesus divine? Is God one or is God three? Uh, is God sovereign or do, or do humans have free will? Um, one of my uh, seminary colleagues has actually made the statement saying that there is no 
fundamental doctrine of Christianity that's not based on an antimony. That is two conflicting statements that both are true. So, we have developed a rich Christology. We've developed Trinitarian theology. Um, does that mean we understand it? No, we even put a, put a name to it doesn't mean that we understand it, but we have to accept this mystery. There's a mystery in our theology, and there's conflict in the theology. If you think historically and the development of Christology, those who said that Jesus was human, therefore he was not divine, uh, they weren't declared heretics for saying Jesus was human, they were saying, he declared heretics for saying he wasn't divine. But then those who said that Jesus was divine, therefore he wasn't human, they were declared heretics not for saying that he's divine, but for saying he was not human. So the affirmations were all true on both sides, the denials were the ones that were, were false on both sides. But if one side had been allowed to defeat the other, we would have never developed the rich Christology that we have. Okay, that's theology, but obviously science, and particularly physics, is all set and certain. We have the universe, we examine, we, we find the laws, how, how the universe is put together, and everything is certain, right? Well, you all know that's not true. Maybe 120 years ago I could have said that, but up comes uh, quantum mechanics, and is light a particle or is light a wave? Are electrons particles or electrons waves? The answer is yes. You go to the laboratory and it proves it's a particle. You go to another laboratory, it proves it's a wave. And sometimes you can set up experiments so that the particle can be leaving. And at some point in time, you choose which to measure. Well, it's on route. And when you make that measurement, either it has been a wave its entire trip or it's been a particle its entire trip. Blows your mind. So there's conflict in the science. So then when I say about what about the conflict between theology and science, well, the only answer I can give you is that if you have put it all together and you see no conflict at all between our the theological doctrine and your scientific uh, statements, then I would say I doubt it very much. Because if there's fundamental mysteries in the theology and fundamental mysteries in the science, when you put it together, there's going to be some conflict. No doubt about it. it. It has to be. That's just the way that the nature is. Now, for me, I actually find it took me a while to get used to this. Uh, when I was in graduate school and I hit quantum mechanics, that's when I had my crisis of faith because I wanted certainty in physics, and all of a sudden I didn't have the certainty. But then I overcame my crisis in faith by recognizing, okay, if I accept mystery in my theology, and I accept that the mysterious God is the one who created the universe I'm studying, and then I should be able to accept that he put some of that mystery into the universe that I'm studying, and so therefore reality being veiled in the same way that God himself is veiled might make sense. So, where do we go from here? So I'd, in conclusion, I just want to give three points that I have found useful. Uh, the first, as I say, is just to embrace the mystery. To recognize that important scientific and theological views come from conflicting views, and that the richest area of developing new science or new theology comes from the interface of that conflict the Christology or the quantum mechanics. And so therefore, when the best science and the best theology appear to disagree, embrace that mystery. Embrace the fact that there is something to learn and to grow from there. Recognizing that just like we will never understand Trinitarian theology totally, we will never understand quantum mechanics totally, uh, we will always have this mystery. God, who is fundamentally mysterious in nature, has placed some of the mystery into his creation. The second that's been quite helpful to me and uh, in studying uh, Maxwell and his development of the relational nature of electricity and magnetism, going from a particle view of uh, Newton to uh, a just more dynamic field-based view of Maxwell and later, uh, is to realize that the most fundamental things are not things. The most fundamental things actually turn out to be relations. 
And this is something that we learn from both our physics and our theology. Uh, Isaac Newton was anti-Trinitarian because he only viewed God, the Trinity, as tritheism. Maxwell accepted the triune God and because he viewed it as a relational, that the Trinity is relational. Uh, you cannot define the Holy Spirit separate from God the Father and God the Son. Um, it's everything, it's the relationship that's most important. Likewise, electricity and magnetism, you can't define electricity separate from magnetism and vice versa. Um, and then Einstein continued this, saying space and time are not the absolute, it's the speed of light, a relational quantity that's the absolute. And third and finally, accept that we don't have all the answers. And so this is saying, uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate this, Thomas Tracy. His statement, talk about theodicy, is saying that uh, <clears throat> we want to understand everything, but we need salvation, and that's more important. And God offers us salvation, not necessarily understanding. Okay. Thank you. Um, since Seth is going to ask a question, I'm going to give him the mic because it's hard to repeat Seth's questions because they're usually involved. <laughs> so here, here's the microphone for you, Seth. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll make it simple. Um, <laughs> yeah, with your, uh, I really appreciate this. I love the, um, you know, the conflicts within science, conflicts within theology, um, and therefore we'd expect conflicts between the fields. But I can see, and I'm not definitely not advocating this. I just want to put it to you. Someone saying, well, we're talking about two different domains. We don't expect a conflict between poetry and science or between, you know, plumbing and, you know, roof, roofing or something like that. You know, like two different domains deal with two different subject areas. So maybe, maybe there isn't a conflict between science and religion because they're, they're not dealing in the same domains. And I, I'm just curious just to throw that out there, how you might reply to that. Yeah, I think my, my biggest response to that is that physics and theology are, are two unique fields in that... Theology is getting at absolute reality, who is God. And to a theologian, that is the absolute reality. Physics is getting at the absolute reality, what is the universe. And I think that there is a level, as, as John Polkinghorne would say, a cousinly relationship between physics and theology for that reason. Poetry and art is describing the human experience, but it's not getting at what is the fundamental nature of reality at a level that physics and theology does. So, so I think that when you look at the, at the relationship between physics and theology, uh, there, there's a, a more significant interaction uh, between the two. Uh, not, that the, not that you look to theology for the answers to your scientific question or vice versa, but that the methods that you use are actually quite similar because you're trying to get at what is the fundamental reality. Yeah, thanks so much for the presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, I don't know, like at a, at a conference like this, you're going to find a friendly audience for what you said, but my, I have two fears. One is that like the, which way does the, which way does the arrow point? So in, in sort of developing empirical science as we have it today, is it that like, these these Christian convictions like led to what we now have as empirical science, or is it? It was a pretty complicated. Empirical science came around, and in retrospect, we can kind of look at it and make these analogies between um, between theology. Because then, I've, my fear is that um, have we sort of given Protestant Christianity too much credit, and was there other were there other other you know contributors from other other faiths, other um, nationalities, etc. That um, also like had a say in forming empirical science as we have it today, even if there's a high degree of consistency now. Yeah, you're getting me into some hot water here with other cultures uh, to answer that. But uh, the modern empirical science that we have now that is universal no matter where you are in the world, uh, uh, people accept, really did come out of Western Europe. Uh, there were other sciences, but if you think about the Chinese science, the Chinese... They had a lot of technology, but they always knew that the universe was too complex to understand, so they never looked for simple laws. 
So there's not this connection to find the, the simple laws. The, the Greeks, of course, with their philosophy that the mind was important and matter was unimportant, uh, didn't see any reason for examining the, uh, the world itself. So they both had what we call strong sciences, but what has really overtaken the world, this empirical, modern empirical science, really did come out of the matrix of uh, Western Christianity. Uh, so I, I think, think I, I can make the, the argument there. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, and a lot of people have talked about this, when you think about the science in separating itself from its roots, it's like a tree cutting off its own roots. How, what is the future of that tree if it doesn't keep its roots? We don't know the answer to that question. And I don't want, want to speculate on that, but that, that, is, that is a concern. I don't understand why assumption two matters. One, three, four, and five, I think you could sell to most scientists, but as you pointed out, Weinberg said the universe is pointless, and my interaction with a lot of scientists is they would agree. How is two relevant? Uh, yeah, well, Weinberg talks about the fact that the universe is pointless, so therefore the point is that we have to provide the point to the universe, which to me I think is, is weak, but I don't understand the point he's making. But for most scientists, we want to do something that's important. And if it's just a game that we're playing, and it's not, it, that we're not talking about something that's important, then, then why bother doing it? So I, you, you can make that argument. I, 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 I will give that. Uh, to you. All right, let's uh, thank Gary once again.